I have the highest pleasure in laying before you an account gathered from their letters of the investigations and observations of the four members of the corresponding society of the Pickwick Club on the occasion of their spending Christmas with their friend Mr. Wardle of the Manor Farm, Dingley Dell, in the county of Kent. Brisk as bees did the four Pickwickians, Mr. Pickwick, Mr. Tupman, Mr. Winkle and Mr. Snodgrass, assemble on the morning of the 22nd day of December. Christmas was close at hand in all his bluff and hearty honesty. Gay and merry was the time, and right gay and merry were at least four of the numerous hearts that were gladdened by its coming. And numerous indeed are the hearts to which Christmas brings a brief season of happiness and enjoyment. How many families whose members have been dispersed and scattered far and wide in the restless struggles of life are then reunited and meet once again. Happy, happy Christmas that can win us back to the delusions of our childish days, that can recall to the old man the pleasures of his youth, that can transport the sailor and the traveler thousands of miles away back to his own fireside and his quiet home. But we are so taken up and occupied with the good qualities of this St. Christmas that we are keeping Mr. Pickwick and his friends waiting in the cold on the outside of the Muggleton coach, which they have just attained, well wrapped up in great coats, shawls and comforters. The portmanteaus and carpet bags have been stowed away. The coachman mounts to the box. Sam Weller, Mr. Pickwick's manservant, jumps up behind. The Pickwickians pull their coats round their legs and their shawls over their noses. The helpers pull the horse cloths off. The coachman shouts a cheery, all right, and away they go. They have rumbled through the streets and jolted over the stones and at length reach the wide and open country. The wheels skim over the hard and frosty ground and the horses, bursting into a canter at a smart crack of the whip, Step along the road as if the load behind them, coach, passengers, portmanteaus, carpet bags, and all, were but a feather at their heels. They have descended a gentle slope and enter upon a level as compact and dry as a solid block of marble two miles long. Another crack of the whip and on they speed at a smart gallop. The horses tossing their heads and rattling the harness as if in exhilaration at the rapidity of the motion. The lively notes of the guard's key bugle sound lustily forth as the coach rattles through the ill-paved streets of a country town. Mr. Pickwick emerges from his coat collar and looks about him with great curiosity. Mr. Winkle, who sits at the extreme edge with one leg dangling in the air, is nearly precipitated into the street as the coach twists round the sharp corner by the cheesemonger's shop and turns into the marketplace. And before Mr. Snodgrass, who sits next to him, has had time to recover from his alarm, they pull up at the inn yard. So at three o'clock that afternoon, they all stood high and dry, safe and sound, hale and hearty upon the steps of the Blue Lion Muggleton. Mr. Pickwick was busily engaged in superintending the disinterment of the portmanteaus and carpet bags, when he felt himself gently pulled by the coat. Looking round, he discovered that the individual who resorted to this method of catching his attention was none other than Mr. Wardle's favourite page, here and after referred to in the pages of this unvarnished history by the distinguishing appellation of the fat boy. Ha ha, said Mr. Pickwick. Ha ha, said the fat boy. He was fatter than ever. Well, you look rosy enough, my young friend, said Mr. Pickwick. I've been asleep right in front of the taproom fire, replied the fat boy, who had heated himself to the colour of a new chimney pot in the course of an hour's nap. Master sent me over with a shay cart to carry your luggage up to the house. He'd have sent some saddle horses, but he thought you'd rather walk, being a cold day. Yes, 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 said Mr. Pickwick. Yes, we would rather walk. Here, Sam, sir, said Mr. Weller, helped Mr. Wardle's servant to put the packages into the cart. Mr. Pickwick and his three friends struck into the footpath across the fields, leaving Mr. Weller and the fat boy confronted. Sam looked at the fat boy with great astonishment but without saying a word and began to stow the luggage rapidly away in the cart. Well, the fat boy stood quietly by and seemed to think it a very interesting sort of thing to see Mr. Weller working by himself. There, said Sam, throwing in the last carpet bag. There they are. Yes, said the fat boy in a very satisfied tone. There they are. 
Well, said Sam, you're a nice specimen of a prize boy, you are. Thank you, said the fat boy. You ain't got nothing on your mind as makes you fret yourself, have you, inquired Sam. Not as I knows on, replied the fat boy. Well, said Sam, I'm glad to hear it. Do you ever drink anything? I likes eating better, replied the boy. Ah, said Sam, I should have supposed that. But what I mean is, should you like a drop of anything as'd warm you, but I suppose you never was cold with all them elastic fixtures, was you? Sometimes, replied the boy, and I likes a drop of something when it's good. Ah, you do, do you, said Sam. Come this way, then. The blue lion tap was soon gained, and the fat boy swallowed a glass of liquor without so much as winking, a feat which considerably advanced him in Mr. Weller's good opinion. Mr. Weller, having transacted a similar piece of business on his own account, they got into the cart. Can you drive, said the fat boy. I should rather think so, replied Sam. There then, said the fat boy, putting the reins in his hand and pointing up a lane. It's as straight as you can go. You can't miss it. With these words, the fat boy laid himself down amongst the portmanteaus and carpet bags and fell asleep instantaneously. Meanwhile, Mr. Pickwick and his friends, having walked their blood into active circulation, proceeded cheerfully on. The paths were hard. The grass was crisp and frosty. The air had a fine, dry, bracing coldness. It was the sort of afternoon that might induce a couple of elderly gentlemen in a lonely field to take off their great coats and play at leapfrog in pure lightness of heart and gaiety. And we firmly believe that had Mr. Tupman at that moment proffered a back, Mr. Pickwick would have accepted his offer with the utmost avidity. However, Mr. Tupman did not volunteer any such accommodation, and the friends walked on. But if they were cheerful and happy outside the house, what was the warmth and cordiality of their reception when they reached the farm? The servants grinned with pleasure at the sight of Mr. Pickwick, and Emma bestowed a half demure, half impudent look on Mr. Tupman, which was enough to make the statue of Bonaparte in the passage unfold his arms and clasp her. The old lady, Mr. Wardle's mother, was seated with customary state in the front parlour, but she was rather cross, and by consequence, most particularly deaf. The old lady never went out herself, and like a great many other old ladies, she was apt to consider it an act of domestic treason if anybody else took the liberty of doing what she couldn't. So, bless her old soul, she sat as upright as she could in her great chair and looked as fierce as might be, and that was benevolent after all. Mother, shouted Mr. Wardle, Mr. Pickwick, you recollect him? Never mind, replied the old lady with great dignity. Don't trouble Mr. Pickwick about an old creature like me. Nobody cares about me now, and it's very natural they shouldn't. Here the old lady tossed her head and smoothed down her lavender-colored silk dress with trembling hands. Come, come, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick. I can't let you cut an old friend in this way. I've come down expressly to have a long talk with you, and we'll show these boys and girls how to dance a minuet before they're eight and forty hours older. The old lady was rapidly giving way, but she didn't like to do it all at once, so she only said, I can't hear him. Nonsense, mother, said Wardle. Now, come, come, don't be cross. There's a good soul. But age has its little infirmities of temper, and she was not quite brought round yet. So she smoothed down the lavender-coloured dress again, and turning to Mr. Pickwick, said, Mr. Pickwick, things was very different when I was a girl. No doubt of that, ma'am, said Mr. Pickwick, and whether the old lady was touched by Mr. Pickwick's affectionate good nature or whatever was the cause, she was fairly melted and all the little ill humour evaporated. A happy party they were that night. 
The best sitting room at Manor Farm was a good, long, dark panelled room with a high chimney piece and a capacious chimney up which you could have driven one of the new patent cabs, wheels and all. At the upper end of the room, seated in a shady bower of holly and evergreens, were the two best fiddlers and the only harp in all Muggleton. In all sorts of recesses and on all kinds of brackets stood massive old silver candlesticks with four branches each. The carpet was up, the candles burned bright, the fire blazed and crackled on the hearth, and merry voices and light-hearted laughter rang through the room. If anything could have added to the interest of this agreeable scene, it would have been the remarkable fact of Mr. Pickwick's appearing without his gaiters for the first time within the memory of his oldest friends. You mean to dance, said Wardle? Of course I do, replied Mr. Pickwick. Don't you see I'm dressed for the purpose? Mr. Pickwick called attention to his speckled silk stockings and smartly tied pumps. Oh, you in silk stockings, exclaimed Mr. Tupman jocosely. And why not, sir? Why not, said Mr. Pickwick, turning warmly upon him. Oh, of course, there's no reason why you shouldn't wear them, responded Mr. Tupman. I imagine not, sir. I imagine not, said Mr. Pickwick in a very peremptory tone. And Mr. Tupman had contemplated a laugh, but he found it was a serious matter. So he looked grave and said they were a very pretty pattern. I hope they are, said Mr. Pickwick, fixing his eyes upon his friend. You see nothing extraordinary in the stockings. As stockings, I trust, sir. Uh, certainly not. Uh, certainly not, <laughs> replied Mr. Tupman. He walked away and Mr. Pickwick's countenance resumed its customary benign expression. We're all ready, I believe, said Mr. Pickwick, who was stationed with the old lady at the top of the dance and had already made four false starts in his excessive anxiety to commence. Then begin at once, said Wardle. Now. Up struck the two fiddles and the one half, and off went Mr. Pickwick and the hands across, when there was a general clapping of hands and a cry of stop, stop. What's the matter, said Mr. Pickwick, who was only brought to by the fiddles and harp desisting and could have been stopped by no other earthly power if the house had been on fire. Where's uh, Arabella Allen, cried a dozen voices. And Winkle, added Mr. Tupman. Here we are, exclaimed that gentleman emerging with his pretty companion from the corner. As he did so, it would have been hard to tell which was the redder in the face, he or a young lady with black eyes. What an extraordinary thing it is, Winkle, said Mr. Pickwick rather pettishly, that you couldn't have taken your place before. Not at all extraordinary, said Mr. Winkle. Well, said Mr. Pickwick, with a very expressive smile as his eyes rested on Arabella. Well, I don't know that it was extraordinary either, after all. However, there was no time to think more about the matter, for the fiddles and harp began in real earnest. Away went Mr. Pickwick. Hands across, down the middle to the very end of the room and halfway up the chimney. Back again to the door. Who set everywhere? Loud stamp on the ground. Ready for the next couple. Off again. All the figure over once more. Another stamp to beat out the time. Next couple and the next and the next again. Never was such going. From the centre of the ceiling, old Wardle had suspended with his own hands a huge branch of mistletoe. And this same branch of mistletoe gave rise to a scene of general and most delightful struggling and confusion. Mr. Pickwick took the old lady by the hand, led her beneath the mystic branch, and saluted her in all courtesy and decorum. The old lady submitted to this piece of practical politeness with all the dignity which befitted so important and serious a solemnity. But the younger ladies, not being so thoroughly imbued with a superstitious veneration for the custom, or imagining that the value of a salute is very much enhanced if it cost a little trouble to obtain it, screamed and struggled and ran into corners and threatened and remonstrated and did everything but leave the room until some of the less adventurous gentlemen were on the point of desisting when they all at once found it useless to resist any longer and submitted to be kissed with a good grace. Mr. Winkle kissed the young lady with the black eyes. Mr. Snodgrass kissed Emily. And Mr. Weller, not being particular about the form of being under the mistletoe, kissed Emma and the other female servants just as he caught them. As to the poor relations, they kissed everybody, not even accepting the plainer portions of the young lady visitors, who in their excessive confusion ran right under the mistletoe without knowing it. 
Wardle stood with his back to the fire, surveying the whole scene with the utmost satisfaction, and the fat boy took the opportunity of appropriating to his own use and summarily devouring a particularly fine mince pie that had been carefully put by for somebody else. Now the screaming had subsided, and faces were in a glow, and curls in a tangle. And Mr. Pickwick, after kissing the old lady as before mentioned, was standing under the mistletoe, looking with a very pleased countenance and all that was passing around him, when the young lady with the black eyes, after a little whispering with the other young ladies, made a sudden dart forward, and putting her arm round Mr. Pickwick's neck, saluted him affectionately on the left cheek. And before Mr. Pickwick distinctly knew what was the matter, he was surrounded by the whole body, and kissed by every one of them. It was a pleasant thing to see Mr. Pickwick in the center of the group, now pulled this way and then that, and first kissed on the chin and then on the nose and then on the spectacles, and to hear the peals of laughter which were raised on every side. When they were all tired, there was a great game at Snapdragon, and when fingers enough were burned with that and all the raisins were gone, they sat down by the huge fire of blazing logs to a substantial supper and a mighty bowl of wassail, something smaller than an ordinary washhouse copper, in which the hot apples were hissing and bubbling with a rich look and a jolly sound that were perfectly irresistible. This, said Mr. Pickwick, looking around him, this is indeed comfort. Our invariable custom at Christmas time, replied Mr. Wardle. Winkle, my boy, break up the fire. Up flew the bright sparks in myriads as the logs were stirred. The deep red blaze sent forth a rich glow that penetrated into the farthest corner of the room and cast its cheerful tint on every face. <laughs> 